Was that it? Yeah. Okay. Am we on? Yeah. We'll have to hold it. Good evening. We're so we apologize for the delay. We're having some technical difficulty. Um, as always, when you got something really to say, you know how that works. There's all these distractions, but we're not going to let that defeat us. So we're just um, looking forward to you all hearing Dr. Vasqueville tonight. Um, she is a an amazing woman, and we are excited that and honored to have her be a part of this live chat on mental wellness, which is very important for us to know what it's gonna take um, during these times. And so we're looking forward to hearing from her tonight. We appreciate you for coming on. And so we're just waiting for her to join us. How are you, Mr. Barry Cox? There and I think you're in Indiana. We welcome you, my Sarah Drew. Thank you, Marcus. Thank you for joining us tonight. Wow. Hi, Tanya. Thank you for joining us. Michigan. Well, we welcome you from Michigan. Past Kalamazoo. Wow. Thank you for joining us. Praise the Lord, Cheryl. Ms. Jameson there in Atlanta. Thank you for coming on and joining us tonight. Hello, Marcus. We're just waiting for our main speaker, Dr. Shipkan Vaskaville. She'll be on tonight. And I just want you to know that this is a just a dialogue that we're going to have in, re in reference to Mental Health Awareness Month. A lot of us are struggling um, in areas that we don't want to talk about. Thank you, Todd, for coming and joining us tonight. But we have some things that we just want to share and dialogue just for a few minutes. As we're not going to hold you all night, but we just want to make sure that everyone uh, understands that there's a support system out here to help. And uh, we want to be able to support you in any fashion that we can. We thank you very much. I shared last week in kicking off um, Mental Wellness Monday. Um, wellness for me is very important and it means the whole totality of a man. And so that's what this is all about. We can't be able to even provide service for somebody or even talk to somebody if we're not doing well as a, a, as a parent, as a father, mother, as a coworker, if we're not healthy. So hi, Sandy. So we want to make sure that we're giving some information tonight that's going to support some of you. Um, that word that we talk about, mental illness, is, is really kind of a taboo word. There's not enough monies and finances that are being poured into us being able to support people that have mental health challenges. And I clearly understand that some of you tonight um, may know someone, a family member, a coworker that is struggling. And it doesn't take much to recognize when those challenges are in their faces. And sometimes they don't want to talk about it or they don't want to seek out the help. But we want to support you. I say that word, support, support. We're going to give you some numbers tonight. Uh, Dr. Baskerville has some numbers that she's going to give, and we're just waiting for her to come on. But meanwhile, I'm a behavioral therapist by trade. Some of you know me and some of you don't. Um, I've been doing this work for probably almost close to 35 years. So I've seen it all from the fashion of fa foster care system to group homes. And now I have the pleasure of working in the field continually here, even in New Jersey. I'm currently in New Jersey temporarily. So I'm providing service for those that are on the spectrum and those that are having emotional and their children. I've worked with adults and children. So tonight, like I said, we just want to enlighten some of you 
that it would be able to, maybe you can share it with someone else um, that um, may have something in, you know, going on in their life and they just don't want to talk about it or they're talking about it and they don't know what direction to go in. Um, so we want to be able to um, stick with something that is going to be realistic. One, before uh, Dr. Backfield comes on, I can tell you right now, some of the things I shared last week was, is, you know, exercising. We got, some of us have to change our diet. We are what we eat. And that's the truth. Some of us have, um, I can say for me, I know there's certain things that are not healthy for me. Um, and they do affect us, not only just physically, but mentally. Um, so I want to be able to let you all know that you're not alone in the trials and the struggles that you're going through. Uh, we have many of you that are across the country. I see my sister in love. Um, she's on Janine. Thank you, Janine, for joining us there from Kansas City. And we have people across the country that we can connect and tap into that be able would be able to assist you in any fashion, in any way possible. Just a few things I want to share while we're trying to still connect Dr. Baskerville. Oh, yeah. She's watching. She's going to have to go out and come back Okay. Okay. Um, Shatan, if you're watching and we want you to come out and then come back on, um, if you can do that for us, please, tonight. But once again, I want to thank you all for joining us. I sincerely apologize for the delay. You know, technology for some of us is very scary. <laughs> For when you get in your 60s, we don't know how to operate all this equipment, but we were working all this on all this all day, and it's been working amazing. Now we're on live, and it's not working properly. So I just want to share with you a few things, some facts, that right now there's over 50 million people that are suffering with diagnosed schizophrenia, psychosis. These are diagnoses. So that means one out of every five adults is suffering from some type of mental health challenge. What is even more scarier and more challenging is that almost 20 million, I said it, 20 million children have been diagnosed with some type of psychotic disorder. That's between the ages of three to 17, three to 17. And not enough money is being poured into the mental health profession to support these people. Um, I, like I said, I've been doing this 35 years as a behavioral therapist. My job is to go into the homes. I've worked on the military bases around the country. And all of these family members are struggling, it's a lot of them. They don't know which way to go. They have people come into their home. It's not enough support. So tonight, we just wanted to kind of just put, spot, uh, put a spotlight on Mental Health Awareness Month, this is May, it's Mental Health Awareness Month, which means out of the whole year, there's only one month that's talking about mental health. It should be a daily dialogue, daily. And I feel like at this moment in my life, because I've had my own personal struggles, I have family members that have struggled, that it would behoove me to keep silent about that and not be able to share with some of you the importance of our mental wellness. You cannot function properly if you're not in the right mental health stance. That means stable across the board. If we need to take medication, let's do that. And that is in particular, she's watching, that in, in particular is for those that are um, taking some type of medication. We want to be able to encourage you to be able to take it and be able to be well with it and not be ashamed. I think we have her on the line. Approve. I want to just let you know that once again we're we're here. Hi. Hi. How are you? Good. Good. We want to welcome you. We're not sure what transpired tonight. But it's all good. We welcome you, Dr. Shatan Baskerville. Thank you. Say hello to our world of the Facebook family. Praise world. the Lord, everyone. Could you try again? We got people coming on from across the country. And once again, like I said, this is our beautiful Dr. Shatan Baskerville, who is a licensed psychologist with a license a registered as a licensed married family therapist. So when you see those letters, L-M-F-T, that means a licensed marriage family therapist. So she can provide the service for you there as well as just being a 
um, a doctor, as a psychologist. Why do we bring someone on like her? Is because she is in the trenches. She sees what's going on. And so tonight, Shatan, I just gave some statistics, which is very staggering, that over 50 million, 50 million adults, that means one out of every five adults has mm -hmm. been diagnosed with a psychotic disorder, diagnosed yes. by someone like you. Yes. But what's even more overwhelming and wants to make me cry is that almost 20 million children between the ages of 3 to 17 have been diagnosed mm -hmm. on the psych as a psychiatric um, diagnosis. So right. can you elaborate on that a little bit more for our audience that has joined in? What What is this? What is yeah. happening across the country? Okay. So, so I am a licensed medical family therapist. I'm a re actually a registered psychologist, which means I'm not yet licensed as a psychologist. I'm collecting hours right now for that. Um, currently, there is a, such a disconnect with the with our people, with our young people. Um, children today doesn't have don't have a lot of structure. Structure is key. For any children that is coming up in any household. There are broken homes. I mean, these are not new stats. What's new is the way that we're handling our children. That's very new. Um, when I say Okay. Uh, last week, and she has four children, and they all have been diagnosed with some type of cogn cognitive disorder meaning maybe ADHD or, um, you know, one of her children now has an eating disorder. And a lot of this is the lack of structure in the home. And some of it is family history. Don't get me wrong. But a lot of it is lack of structure. We had, we went to bed at a certain time. And so people were more connected with the children. And I mean, with this pandemic that's going on now, you hear people saying, mothers saying, I'm not a school teacher. I need, I don't know what to do myself with my children. How do I get help? How do I? I don't know why she's freezing up. We understand that. However, if you just get basic structure in the home, it goes a long ways. I mean, come on. Everyone on this line, when we were coming up, we ate at a certain time. We went to bed at a certain time. We need, we, we, we receive rest. Rest is key. You know, don't forget we're made up of mind, body, soul, and spirit. And so we forget about the physical side of, we, we deal with the natural, I mean, the, 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 the spiritual, we, but we don't deal with the natural as much. So a lot of these children need basic structure. Even if they have been diagnosed and it's on the spectrum, structure is key. I mean, even a child with autism, and Jeanette, you know, know this as a behavior specialist, what is the key? If you throw a child that's on the spectrum off of their game, off of their uh, um, schedule, what happens? Yeah, it spins them into chaos. Into chaos. Yeah. And then a lot of these kids, I work at, right now, I work at a rape crisis center. Um, and, you know, working at a rape crisis center, I'm constantly dealing with trauma. Another thing is that our kids are being exposed to trauma, a lot of trauma. Bullying can be traumatic for our children. Absolutely. That, that's one of the things. A lot of these kids are isolating. They are being bullied on social media, which is causing them to take their lives. And so a lot of these things are not new. They're not new. But the difference is, is that we, we have ready information. So in other words, whereas we did not get information sometimes for years because we didn't, we didn't have the privilege of having social media. Now yeah. information is constantly being fed to us, which in turn provoke anxiety and leads to depression and leads to all these other disorder because the social media is being used inappropriately. Absolutely. So speaking of social media, because we're on social media right now. Absolutely. Um, it's, so let's talk about those kids that have had trauma and adults, because let's talk about kids become teenagers, then adults. Mm -hmm. What happens when that trauma takes place as a child? And then now we're in 2020 and that child is an adult. What, mm -hmm. is, what are some of the behaviors? What are some of the things that right. you when you're coming in your office? Even if 
because of the chemical, and, and this is what I'm saying that we're made up all together. It's because of the chemical that goes through our things like that. When we're young, we have enough of that to war off anxiety, depression, a lot of times. And so when we start to get older and all those traumas that happen to us, and don't forget, the body still holds it. And there's this right. book that's called um, The Body Keeps the give me a minute I think it's called the body keeps the score and in there it talks about a lot about how the body keeps the score like in other words even sometimes if, if the mind has forgotten but then somebody come and touch you inappropriately because yeah. you were sexually molested then yeah. it'll trigger you and then the mind will start remembering so don't think that just because you forgot in the mind that the body doesn't hold that 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 touch or yeah. that that dog that memory so we're all so con the body is so connected i'm telling you the word of god said we're fearfully and wonderfully made and i get the wonderful part now so so when you're young and that trauma has taken place in in your life and you you have the chemical balance to ward off when you get older not so much if it hasn't been dealt with that's so exactly. whereas when I was a child, I might have been a little bit anxious. Now I'm an adult and all of my trauma hasn't been dealt with. So now my mind begins to go back. Sometimes it goes back or sometimes it doesn't even go back. It just can't wear off all of the anxiety and depression that I'm now faced with today. And all of those triggers that I can once wore off before, I can't deal with them. Because that's Okay, yeah. there you go. So, no, and so I, I realized that just what you're saying, the trauma and the triggers, what can we do? And I'm going to go, I'm going to break it all the way down to us as a, a people mm -hmm. of color. Mm -hmm. We have a tendency not to want to get help. We don't want mm -hmm. anybody in our business, but we're mm -hmm. suffering. And we're suffering at, a, at, a, at an alarming rate because yes. as we already see COVID-19 has already shown that most African mm -hmm. Americans are, are the leading in deaths with COVID-19. Mm -hmm. We suffer because of our, you know, we have, we're coming with pre-existing conditions. Right. So let's talk about why our people are not getting the help that we need to get. You know, therapy is still pretty taboo in the African American, in the in in the people of people of color. Period. It's not just African American, Asians, Latina right. people. I mean, in the in the minorities. Um, one, it's the whole. The, like you said, it goes back to the roots. As you know, we don't air our dirty laundry. That was something that was instilled in us early on. Um, however, I do see a shift in that. The younger people don't mind going to therapy. They don't. They don't mind reaching right. out. They don't mind going to their pastor. It's it's some of us that are older that still have a problem with that. But the problem, the other problem is, is that there's no, there's not, there's a disconnect with the generations when we were coming up. We listened to the same music our parents listened to. We did the same dances. We did all of those things. But now, you know, music is separated. Um, in the church, you don't see a lot of mothers anymore that are rearing the yeah. young people. And if you do find a young person and you find a mother that's willing to go there, the young person doesn't really want to listen. You know, they have their own way of doing things. And let me tell you, we cannot do the same things we did with these children as we did with our children. It doesn't work. It doesn't work. It doesn't work. Um, and what I mean by that is that every child is so unique that you have to handle them very differently. You have to consider, you know, what their upbringing was, where are they right now, what are some of the things that they're dealing with. And the thing is, is that we have to get these kids talking because, you know, yeah. we have all these sayings out in the world, uh, 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 snitches get stitches and things yeah. like that. So how would a kid come to you or your grandchild or child come to you if they're too afraid that we're going to run up to the school and confront in a way that's going to sh shame them right? to where they really won't speak out? So you have to really communicate with the child and ask the child, 
how do how would you like for us you need to talk to me and once they tell you no don't tell okay how would you like that for this to be handled and i know it's not today modern day this is not our old-fashioned way of doing things but modern day right now we have to approach these kids differently because they are not first of all they're not as we were we didn't know half of the things that these kids know now we are not we are not privy to half of this information i mean how, how many of us as grandparents have our children helping us our grandchildren helping us with modern technology who's five and six and seven years old absolutely Absolutely. And so that brings me to a point for some of the individuals that are on viewing with us. I see Dana Hendricks is on. She's a school teacher working in the special education. Mm -hmm. the, the, the sexual predators, because most mm -hmm. of this, this trauma takes place as young. So there are millions of sexual predators out there. And I, I'm not going to I'm not going to dumb this down at all. There are women that are sexual predators. We're hearing more mm -hmm. about that. So what, what can we do once again to support our children? And, and we're talking mm -hmm. about adults too, but in particular, our children. What can we do? And you've said some of those things, but what are some of the other things that we can do when you know that a child has been um, violated over mm -hmm. and over? This pandemic has flushed everyone home. So we yes. can't visibly see these kids during the Never. daytime anymore because right. the schools are closed. So what can we do? Share that. So one thoughts. of the things you, you have to do with kids is that when a child has been harmed, their behavior will change. Yes. Their Absolutely. behavior will change. Their sleep pattern change. You'll start to hear night. They'll start to have nightmares. Um, their eating pattern will change. They'll start being more isolative. They get very aggressive and irritable. All these are signs that there has been something that shifted in my child, in my grandchild, in my neighbor, in whomever the child may be. All of a sudden, you have a six-year-old who was vibrant and outgoing, and now they don't want to play. They're very aggressive. They're hitting other children. They're irritable. They're crying at the drop of the hat. You have to explore that. You cannot ignore those things that you see in these children. If you're a school teacher, and I know school teachers are able to pick up on that. That's why my, I, my hat goes out, my hand goes up to school teachers. I think that they're fabulous because that's the schools are one of the main sources of, of, of um, agencies that do the child abuse reporting because of the, the shift in the behavior in the child. Um, there's a lot of other signs and symptoms, especially with sexual assault, that you'll see that a child will start behaving differently. And, and sometimes it's subtle. It's not always obvious. It's not always obvious, but you have to talk to your child. You have, and children will talk if they're secure. Yes. If they so, are secure in their environment. So that goes back to the environment. So what's happening right now, I think across the, the, the country right now, is we're seeing an increase in our um, parents, adults that are on meth, that are using all types of substance abuse. A lot of them had already been diagnosed because a lot mm -hmm. of the behavioral issues that we see in a lot of adults is hereditary, it's generational. Mm -hmm. So what, when you have some of these people coming into your office and they're bringing their kids, you just talked about mm -hmm. that earlier, um, what are some of your recommendations that you're doing with some of these family members, especially the parent? And then that has yeah. trickled down to the children. Mm -hmm. It's funny because a lot of times the, kid, the parent will bring the child, but when we're exploring the, ch exploring the child of what we call the presenting problems, the problems that bring them into our agency, we'll find that the apple don't fall too far from the tree. And, a, and nine times out of 10, that mother or that father have had their own sexual assault. Yes. So what we've done is that we also offer services to that mother and that father. And our services are completely free um, at the agency that I work at. But you have you have to you have to actually live in the area. Um, and so what we're finding is that, you know, not only is that parent affected, but the other children in that household, of course, are affected. And if that the other children weren't sexually assaulted. We also offer them services because we have to make people aware. Yes. And that's the thing. So a lot of times parents are able to recognize, and some parents don't even recognize that, you know, this has happened to me 
And I said, and I vowed that I would not allow this to happen to my child, but yet it happened anyway. It's the same way with parents who go to the foster care system. Um, people who get placed in foster care nine times out of 10, if I was in foster care, then nine times out of 10, my children would end up in foster care system as well. So it's those generational curses that are, people don't like to call it that, but it's the truth. Anyhow, it's those generational curses that need to be broken down. And so when you have those generational curse, as a parent, in order for that to be broken, you have to start. And it's me. It's me, oh Lord, standing in the need of prayer. Not my mother, not my father. It's me. We have to start with us. We have to start with us. And then we have to be honest with our children that this is what's going on. And this is what ha has happened in our, in, in our family. And this yeah. is who you stay away from. Yeah. And this is what that looks like. You do, you know, it, we, you know what we say, you, when we, when we know better, we do better. Yes. But sometimes we know and we don't do. Because but, why mm -hmm. would that be? Why won't, why would we stigma, do that? Stigma, yeah. stigma. And it's, it goes back to, oh my goodness, they're going to look at me as this mother, that mother, that later for that, later for that, later for yes, you know, if, if you were sexually assaulted before, you know, don't, don't let that prevent you from getting help. Let me tell you why. One, you're still giving the power to that sexual assault. You're still allowing that thing to run your life. But if you get to the place where you have a voice and you can speak up and speak out and you're able to go and get some help Trust and believe your life would change. You know, trust and believe. This is why if you look at even the in the church, you know, including myself, the obesity and all of this other stuff that comes with being saved sometimes, you know, because we don't speak out and people, you'll go to even a person in the church that doesn't have any type of experiences or anything like that and you just want to talk but they don't leave they you leave there feeling more empty and then you're ashamed because you bought up any information that you've given to them but they're not equipped to handle some of these issues and the, and now we have so many therapists and so many people who are in the church that can handle these issues that you can talk to that can help you even if you were you're 55 and you were molested at five because it's still haunting you and it's preventing you from having a relationship. It's preventing you from losing weight. It's preventing you from doing all of these things that cause us to be stagnant and not to live, live in the abundance of life that Christ has called us to live in. That's excellent. That's excellent. There's so many of our viewers that are watching right now have joined us, um, Dr. Baskerville. And I, I want to mm -hmm. ask you, I want to shift gears for a second and go sure. back to what is also on the rise from this COVID-19, of course, is the mental health. This month, it was shining the spotlight on it, but not enough. So mm -hmm. I, I was listening to a uh, young lady, uh, father, Lauren, Dr. Um, Bryn. He is a known, uh, well-known uh, surgeon here in New York. Um, his daughter took his, her life last week. Uh, many of you may know mm -hmm. this, uh, Lauren. She was the head of the medical team in here in New York. She took her life. They mm -hmm. said she had no mental health challenges whatsoever. Now her father is speaking out and saying that mm -hmm. he feels that it may be a very much a link between COVID-19 um, mm -hmm. and, the, and the virus itself. Do, do mm -hmm. you, you want to speak on that or maybe shed some light on yeah, what you're talking about? I, I actually have, I, I also have a small private practice and I have a, um, one of my clients that's actually an RN and she's on the front line and, and we, and at this point in her, in her treatment, she's kind of like just do check-ins with me here and there because um, we ended a few weeks, a few months ago prior to COVID-19 on the arise, we, um, we ended sessions with her. So she, she'll call me and say, hey, I need a tune-up. And she's been on the front line. She called me. She said she needs a tune-up. One of the questions I asked her, I said, What's where? What's that mean? A tune -up. Oh, I'm sorry. She needs a tune-up. In other words, you know, my anxiety is high. She was diagnosed with anxiety disorder. My anxiety is high. I'm on the front line. I'm working 12-hour shifts. I'm, I'm, I'm doing 
you know, my regular job, but I also put in some travel time because I feel like it's my duty to help. So we had to get her anxiety back down. So she back down so she can go back into the, on the battlefield. So what I'm learning and one of the things I ask her is, is mental health there with you guys? And she said, no. I said, what do you mean? No. She, I said, you mean to tell me that you guys are seeing people die in record numbers that you've never dealt with before. And at the end, that there's no debriefing. There's no debriefing. You don't debrief with anyone. You don't talk to anyone. You're, not, you're leaving home on top of maybe your physical person being exposed, but now psychologically, you're still at a place where you're more downcasted, way down. She said, no. She said that they said that they would provide that for us. I have not yet seen anyone. This is why I'm calling you. And I, that was mind blowing to me. Mm -hmm. There is no way a person that's in the healthcare field, no way that cares about people. You can lose a person one night and may not lose another person for a year or two or a few months or so, but to lose a person one after the other and have to call a, one family after the other and re-traumatize yourself, it is not healthy. Mental health needs to be there around the clock to provide services for our healthcare workers. It's just that simple. And, it's and, not a rocket scientist. It's just that simple. And the reason why we're not, so I was called to, uh, through Governor mm -hmm. Cuomo's office here in New York, I'm in New Jersey, to provide a, as a crisis counselor. They wanted me to come to the hospital. But of course, of COVID-19, and we're the hotspot between New York and, mm -hmm. and New Jersey, there's not enough of us. And that goes back to what you were saying. If we're not healthy as healthcare professionals, mm -hmm. how can we go on the battlefield to assist. I mean, it's a vicious cycle. I it mean, is. It is. And and again, this is where social media can be used at its best. You know, we're on Zoom. We're doing classes. Why can't you do classes? I mean, not classes, but sessions every hour on the hour. When you get off work, there's a mental health profession that's there. Here's that number for the day. Call in, check in. And in fact, it really should be required. Yeah. Just so that their mental health they're stable. If you could, if you need a group, if you do one on one. What I found that was interesting, though, when I talked to my particular client and I asked her, I said, "What about amongst each other? Do you guys debrief amongst each other? Do you are you able to go in and have that session when we break, where you break down and you can actually cry because you're human and you felt the pain of the death of someone that you might have witnessed or." the doctor call or you had to call. And one of the things that I found interesting, she says, we're not allowed to do that. So what do you mean you're not allowed to do that? She said, it's an unspoken norm amongst mental health profession that we don't cry like that. And we don't air our feelings and we don't get in touch with our feelings. And I said, so you're telling me that you can just have lost a little baby, but tears may stream, but you cannot do that cry where that pain is actually being released, right? Because we know that tears are purifying, right? Yes. You know, and so you can't get that out. You know, I just found that that was really heart-wrenching for me to hear that. Absolutely. And so, because in my mind, I thought, okay, so if you guys were not going to allow mental health to come in, then maybe that's something you guys can do amongst each other. Because who to better understand what you've just gone through, someone who else who was right there had just gone through it, right? You know. Well, so. and, and that brings tears to my eyes. Why? Because we're in this, this is what we do. You know, this is what we do. And we're here to support. When they are not allowed that support, you know, that is really horrifying, to be honest. Mm -hmm. um, I know that, you know, the time is, is caught up with us, but let me ask you this. Um, what does wellness mean to you? What, when you hear that word wellness, mm -hmm. can, you, can you share with our viewing audience, what, what does that really mean? For me, wellness is, is all the way around. Um, me and my, I have, I, I, for me, I, I have to get my psychological being under control before everything else falls in place. Mm. Meaning this, 
that wellness to me means that my physical, my spiritual, my mental being is all connected and in tune. In tune with what? In tune that when that discernment comes up, that my mind is so clear that I can, I don't, in hindsight, 2020, look back and say, wow, I missed that opportunity. Wow, I missed this. I miss, Because now I'm so connected spiritually first. Mm. Because if I'm connected spiritually, the Lord is going to lead and guide me into all truth. He's going to do that for me. And so when he's leading me and guiding me to all truth, then I can say, like I was telling you, I was sitting in a class and the Lord placed it on my heart to, to write a little letter note to this one sister. And I said, you know, I could, I could be missing a mark, but I don't think so. I don't know anything about this sister in my Sunday school class, nothing. And I said to her, uh, and in fact, never saw until I came to the class. Um, I said to her, the Lord placed it on my heart to provide services for you and your husband free of charge because he's, he's told me to do to do this. I don't know if I missed the mark, but I need to, I need to, and if, and if, you, if I stand corrected, please correct me. I don't mind. I don't mind you telling me, oh, you're way off. I'm not trying to offend you, but this is what God has placed on my heart. She turned around and said, absolutely. My marriage is going through. I, we do need the help. And the, the, the offer is there. I've, and she says she'll talk to her husband, haven't gotten back to me. So the offer is there. And, and so those are the kind of things I have to be, for me, that's what wellness is, to be well-rounded, to want to hear from God. If I hear from God, he's going to tell me how everything else in my life is going to strategically fall in line. But I have to keep him first. I have to be in tune with him so that I can know what my next move is. Excellent. Excellent. That's so good. And so let's talk about that for a minute. So you have been championing um, and, and going through this really ama amazing transformation. And mm -hmm. there are people that are here. Um, and so why don't you tell us, give us some tools that have been helping you to be balanced, that have helped you as you're, you're, a, psycho you, you're I, I, a therapist. I, I, what are some I'm of still trying to get the, I'm still using? trying to get the balance part. <laughs> so what are some um, of the things that, that you've used as tools? Because, mm -hmm. um, you know, let's talk about that for a minute. What are some of the things as we're closing out that you've, yeah. that you've done? Um, one, this is my, this is the one question I kept, I would say to myself, this is my first Second time, well, third, actually, been on a, a really strategic weight loss journey. And then this time is forever. I, I would not go back to Egypt. But one of the things I kept telling the Lord, I have all this Holy Ghost. And you told me I have power to trample over serpents, to do all these things. And I can't close my mouth. Mm -hmm. What a slap in the face. That was one thing I kept saying. Lord, um, uh, forgive me, help me. That's one thing. The other thing that really bothered me as a therapist is that how can I sit back, uh, sit across from a client and I'm 300 pounds and try to help them with their problems when I'm eating mine? Mm, wow, that's powerful. And so that's one of the things that really... And I, I, I kept, I kept questioning that. How can I minister to others? How can I help others? And when I say minister, I mean, therapy is a ministry, whether yes. you want to believe it or not, but how can I do that? Whether a person is saved or unsaved, what would they think coming in? Cause I know I had a therapist, very large man. And I'm sitting back saying to him, you fat, I'm fat. <laughs> you know, let's keep it real. Let's keep I'm it a real. therapist. You're a psychologist. You know, what, 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 what are we doing here? I think I saw him after he said to me, you know, uh, when I walked in one day, I think I saw this gentleman twice. And the second time he, I walked in, he said, hey, would you like an m, &M? I said, that's it. I got to change my life. You're going to offer me, first of all, one m, &M. I don't want an m, &M. I'm here to help to get my myself under control. And so I think that that speaks volumes. I can't, there is no way I would want to walk in a therapist's office that's 300 pounds because you're not dealing with your own stuff. So I started dealing with my own stuff inside. 
inside. First. And the Lord sent me to, and he'll be on next week, it's, it's Minister Reed. And he sent me to him. And the first thing he did, he had me to start writing down things. And when he started having me to write, write down things, I love his approach because I didn't have to, I didn't have to go into a lot of details with my personal stuff. But one of the things I told him, I said, Minister Reed, I'm going to tell you, I'm losing this weight and I would not gain it back. So within three pounds of me seeing myself kind of go up, I have to pull back. And then I have to examine, why do I want to eat? What is going on? Because I, I am an emotional eater, which most of us are. So these are the kinds of, kinds of things that for me, that I had to come to grips with, had to come to resolve issues that I had from a child. My childhood issues that was coming over into my adulthood that I had to reconcile. Just me and God. It wasn't me and my therapist. It was actually me and God. However, when I have gone to a therapist, I'm really cautious because I have gone to people who are not saved, but they were able to help me for this life. And I had to put that in perspective as well. That's you awesome. know, if I, if I can't get to a saved therapist, at least Lord help me to find one to, can, that can help me with my day-to-day -day issues in this life. And as they're talking to me, I'm thinking of a scripture that they're giving, that, that they don't know that they're giving me. That's and awesome. I was like, Mom, that's what God meant by that. So that's one, you've dealt with your, you're dealing with your emotional mm -hmm. things in, internally, right? Mm -hmm. So what is the other mm -hmm. thing? You're, you're what? Are you exercising? I do. I, I, but this is the thing for me. I like, I do actually enjoy exercising. And especially now since where I, my, my job is a hundred percent home now. So I enjoy going up. So the first thing I do in the morning, Jeanette, this is my routine. Six o'clock, I wake up. From six to 6.30 is my, seriously, my Bible reading. I only do 30 minutes in the morning because, you know, that's my daily bread. That's going to get me started. And then I'll lay there and I may do a prayer um, or I may pray first. But nevertheless, that's, I'll say six, six is about 6.45. I jump up. I get on my workout clothes. I go. I work out. I do something around the house because all the gyms are closed. So I'm mask up. I have heels around my house that I do. I have stairs around here that I do. I come home. Sometimes I do a YouTube video, but my routine is at least five days a week. And then I'm trying to encourage this other person who's gained a tremendous amount of weight. So I, I'll go with her in the evening. So sometimes I'll go two times, but the main thing is that I do go in the morning by myself. That's me. And, that's still me and God's time. For some reason, when my thoughts are clear, I can so hear from him. When I'm out there, I'm praying for people. I'm getting, I'm trying to get divine revelation of what he would have for me to do, how I can minister to my children and my husband. So it's those things, how I, that just sets my day. I come home, then I'll, you know, then I'll, and I'm, I'm always, I'm always like grabbing my tablet to look up something that might have a thought might have come, whether it's a biblical thought or whether it's a natural some, something or whether it's something psychological that I need to look up. I'll grab my tablet. I'll grab my laptop. I'll grab whatever is near me, even my phone say, mm, I was thinking about this. Let me kind of look that up. So then I'll, then I'll probably kind of start and I'll call it, you know, start calling my staff. And, yeah. and so when you do that, do you encourage uh, your clients when they're coming in, do they journal? Do you have them journaling? Um, because I, I do. know that that's it, de it depends. Everyone doesn't like to journal. Right. And everyone won't journal. And then I always tell people, be careful with journaling because you don't want anything that people can get a hold to to read. So you have to really be careful. So right. I do encourage my clients to journal, those who like to. But for the most part, I also, uh, if I have a client that's anxious, we do more like a bedtime routine because those are the ones who have a problem. They may go to sleep, but they have a problem staying asleep. Right. So, you know, um, I get into those kind of things. Um, journaling, I definitely encourage them to exercise. Um, I, the nurse that I was telling you guys about, I t she loves yoga. I said, okay, yoga is great and it does clear your mind, but where is the energy that you're exerting? She, she's, she's anxious. The other thing I talked to her about is, you know, you, when you have anxiety, you have to let go of the coffee. They don't mix. <laughs> it's gonna make you more anxious. For some of you, know, I think so, I gotta include me. That yes, can't do the coffee. Can't do the coffee with you have anxiety. 
Yeah. So, so, so if you find yourself really anxious and you're jittery and all that kind of stuff, you know, you better check your caffeine intake. You know, so she was one who drank a lot of caffeine. And once we got the caffeine down and she started doing decaf, the anxiety went down. She was ready. You know, she was ready and she was shocked. She's like, I don't think it's that. I said, let's try it. Let's not, let's try it first. And so she did. And she came back and she was very honest. You were right. It's the caffeine. It's and the so caffeine. I know we've been talking and we were supposed to be, it's a 30 minute chat, but this is good stuff, Dr. Bachelor. It's great yeah. stuff that you're, the information that you're giving us. What are some things that as we're, you know, as we're getting ready to close out, what are some, just some great advice that you could give to, you know, those that have joined us right now, because there's many on here, um, my sister's on here in Kansas City. You know, she's a, 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 as well as a doctor in education. There's a lot of educators. Mm -hmm. I see Patty, Aguilar, mm -hmm. Marlene. All, a lot of the health professionals are mm -hmm. on here tonight. Well, what would you one suggest of the during this time? We're yeah, one in the of, house. We're locked in. What's, what can we, we do? We are. And one of the biggest things that's on the mental health arise is loneliness. Yes. Loneliness. A lot of people are lonely. Yeah. And so... This is a time for you to actually start reaching out to people that you haven't reached out to in a very long time. This is a time for you to start connecting to those people that you start to see, that you thought, you know what, I'll give her a call later. Or I'll call her later. I'll call her. And now is the time to start reaching out. Now is the time to reach out and to be honest. I, I think that honesty is the best, as they used to say, the best policy. Because if you're honest and say, listen, I called you because I need to talk because I am lonely. I am feeling alone. And and so one of the things I, I mean, yeah. and, and my heart does go out to um, a lot of my single friends because one of the things I told my husband when this first happened, I said, you know, this COVID-19, I said, you know, one of the things I'm appreciated, appreciative to you about, honey, is that I'm so glad if I, since I have to go through this, that I have somebody to go through this with. But everybody doesn't have that testimony. Yeah. So I would say to you who don't, Find someone who's like faith. Find someone who you can talk to. Find someone who don't say, what are you doing calling me at this hour? You know what I'm saying? Because sometimes loneliness come at one o'clock in the morning and you need to reach out. Yes. You know, so find that person. Trust me, they are there. And be honest. Let's start being honest about our feelings. Because, you know, like our parents would say, you know, Tell the truth and shame the devil. See, the devil has power in <laughs> secret. <laughs> Come on, sister. That's when the power, the, the, that's when it has the most power is when it's a secret. But when you start being honest about who you are and what you feel, he that's has true. no place to go with that. Because as long as he can keep it in your mind and keep magnify it, magnifying it and keep allowing your, your mind to be his workshop, He's going to have a field day with you all day long. So let's be honest about our feelings. Let's reach out. That's awesome. That's You're not awesome. alone. You're, You're not, not alone. alone. You're not. And we're here. Uh, do you mind? Um, Dr. Uh, Tatan yeah. Baskerville is with us. She uh, resides in Chino, California. So she's mm -hmm. way on the West Coast. But do you mind sharing your number with us? Absolutely uh, not. For those um, let me give it to you. I kind of wrote it down. It looks kind of scribbled. But if you can talking to you but let me tell you this um i am not it's unless you're really in california it's we're prohibited from seeing people in other states because i'm not licensed in other states however i could definitely encourage you in the things of god so yeah. you call me i can definitely encourage you i will definitely pray with you i can give you some tidbits on anything that you may be going through but i won't be able to take you on as a client so i just kind of want to make that clear that's awesome. Okay. So do you want to give out so, give out your office yes. number? I don't know. If, oh, it's just backwards. Huh? Let me give you yeah. my phone number. Um, in fact, I'm going to put it down here in the comments. Good. Thank you so much, Dr. Baskerville. We, uh, I mean, this, my is pleasure. Been, um, this is the kickoff for us for a Wellness Monday. For those of you all that may not know me, I am J.S. Dell. My name is Jeanette Bentley, but... J.S. Dell is my author name, as well as um, a lot of people call me Jay. And this is uh, my ministry. Oh, Grace Ministries is providing a service um, for individuals that want to be well, want to be healed 
emotionally, spiritually, mentally, and physically, as Dr. Baskerville yeah. said. Over these next few weeks, we're going to have some outstanding speakers. Not only does Dr. Baskerville, but um, Minister Lamont Reed, who is an excellent, excellent um, health and wellness coach. Um, and yes. then, uh, at the end of the month, we're going to have a doctor's medical doctor um, that will be coming on. And these are all people that I personally know. Uh, Dr. Angel Schaefer, MD, that works for Kaiser Mental Health in Los Angeles. These are people I've known for a long time, and they're all professional people. We want to be well all the way around, emotionally, spiritually, physically. And so tonight, girl, come on. We weren't supposed to be on the line. That's what they thought. But we're here yeah. to Hello. support you. There's so many of you. We love you. We appreciate you. Um, we ask God to continue to surround you through this COVID-19 as we're um, on quarantine. Some of us that he would put his arms around you. Call yes. me. Some of you know my number. Reach out to me through um, uh, social media. Reach out to Dr. Baskerville. She's going to make herself yes. available. Listen, I'm doing telehealth. So that means you can see me. I can see you. We can talk. in confidential. Nobody, and I'm not charging anybody as well. So, hey, let's get healthy in 2020. Yes. The enemy tried to slice us and dice us. It's not going to work. We're here. We're more than conquerors. Dr. Vasco, yes. we Hallelujah. love you. We love, love you. you we love you. Thank you so much for being here. Good night, everybody. Come back next Monday. If the Lord's Terry, Amen. Wellness Monday with yes. Minister Lamont Reed. Tell somebody to come on. We yes. love you guys. Have a great night. God bless Amen. you. Amen. God bless you.